thanks for having us. Uh, thanks to Barrel. I know hedge funds have been a little bit uh, out of the limelight, so you know, not the most popular place to be uh, in recent years. But I, I think taking a, a little bit of a, a step deeper in the search for alpha, we had a broader discussion with Jackie Led earlier, which I thought was great. Um, but really thinking about you know this part of the market, which um, for some time hasn't had uh, let's say the most robust opportunity set. But before we get there. Uh, if we could just go down the row here, if anyone would just mind introducing themselves, background, area focus, and maybe a little bit of a personal tidbit about yourself would be great. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Jackie Rosner from Pamco Prisma, and uh, we're a fund of funds, and we allocate to various hedge fund strategies, and I look after the uh, macro and relative value trading strategies. And I guess uh, in terms of personal tidbit, um, I would say... Uh, uh, because of my height, I'm 6'7", uh, people walk up to me and they automatically assume, they ask me if I play basketball. So my first question is, I ask them if they follow the NBA. And a lot of times they look at me and they say no, so I tell them I play for the New York Knicks. <laughs> now, then they look at me with some look of confusion, maybe they can't tell, is it possible? But the moral of the story is, um, when you have a story and there's someone in the audience that was there, Charles Smith, who was a professional NBA player and he's here, I have to adapt my story. So, <laughs> so anyway, good thing today keep, we're keep talking about hedge funds and alpha and not my imaginary NBA stories. So we can so. ask for your autograph. Yeah, okay, cocktail hour. <laughs> exactly. Ark. Thanks, John. Uh, Ark Vinokur, I work for K2 Advisors. We are an allocator to hedge funds. I oversee credit event and relative value strategies and have done a number of other things at the firm in the past. Um, professional tidbit, I've been with the firm for 19 years, which is the equivalent of about 140 in, in dog years, or hedge fund years, as we call them. Um, and uh, K2 is part of the Franklin Templeton uh, corporate umbrella, so I'll be expecting all the uh, you know easy questions. From yeah, yeah, Art. I know you were already trying to dodge some of those questions earlier. So. I'm Sophie Van Royen. I'm the CIO for quantitative strategies at Asset Management One here in New York. AM1 is the product of a merger in the asset management space of Mizuho and Daiichi, so two very large entities. Our footprint is very large in Japan and Asia, obviously. Uh, in the US, I'm responsible for um, risk premium and quantitative strategies, as well as the development of blended products, I would say, in collaboration between Tokyo and New York. And a personal tidbit you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I'm a fencer. And um, people keep me, whenever they see me with my bag, they keep mistaking me for a mandolin player. <laughs> Thank you. Mark. Hi, my name is Mark Malek. I run a quant macro hedge fund, which uh, I started back in 1999. Um, with an all-weather strategy, but with a very um, high convexity, where we tend to do very well in periods of risk reversion. Uh, personal tidbit is um, I got into this uh, whole business by accident after I, re I received a grant um, while in college uh, from the Pentagon to do research on how to um, maximize, how to optimize the placement of tanks in a battlefield to maximize the chance of winning. That ended up having an application in finance and got me headhunted by Solomon Brothers. An eternity ago. Here you are on the stage. Um, yeah, and lastly, I'll just quickly, John Ivan Exo with Franklin Temple Investments, uh, global investment management firm. I focus on our alternative investment platform. It's about 260 billion in assets, everything from private equity, secondaries, uh, seed stage, uh, blockchain investing, venture, private credit, hedge fund solutions across the board. Uh, personal tidbit for me, I've actually played on this stage a number of times, like right in this spot. Um, the Cutting Room is an amazing venue. I'm so glad we're doing this here today. Uh, I've played in a band called the Warriors for Mars, and we play for a charity called The Leg to Stand On, a wonderful organization that raises money for children in pretty terrible parts of the world who've lost their limbs. So um, it's delighted, I'm delighted to be back here on the stage. Now um, you're playing again. You're playing the role of moderator. There, there we go. Just a few feet away. Can you believe it? I also give out autographs alongside Jackie. Um, <clears throat> anyway, let's get to the heart of the matter. We have a lot of... Uh, Great content. We did have a pre-discussion uh, a few days ago, which um, we struggled to actually squeeze uh, the amount of, of time that we have with all the content here. So let's get right to it. Um, I think it'd be great to start if we could level set around the definition of alpha. 
Um, you know, hedge funds have had a pretty challenging backdrop really the last, let's call it 12 to 14 years, I think Art pointed out, it's been quite a period of time where, you know, we just not had that dispersion and so forth. So, Mark, in, in your studies, I know you've talked about, um, you know, some of the dynamics that affect the ability to generate alpha. So, could you maybe share with us some of those studies and what you've learned? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, um, you know, uh, one of the most important things is defining alpha. Um, and I think in order to define alpha, what you really have to first come up with is what is your beta? And one of the, historically, the way people have looked at hedge fund alpha, because, I mean, when you're looking at alpha for the, you know, for a mutual fund that trades uh, large cap US stocks, it's very easy, you know, use the S&P 500 as your benchmark and, you know, you apply the formula, the alpha falls out. So when it comes to hedge fund, people didn't have an equivalent S&P 500. Um, so, um, you know, they, they thought about it and said, okay, well, uh, how about we compare one hedge fund to calculate their alpha to a group of other hedge funds doing the same thing, which is great for relative uh, performance, but it really has nothing to do with alpha. And one of the ways it fails miserably is that we know that one of the biggest drags on alpha are fees. And when you're comparing one hedge fund charging to a 20 to a group of other hedge funds uh, charging to and 20 you get the fee structure in the numerator and the denominator, so it falls out, so you basically. So um, in one of our earlier paper that we published in 2002, um, we just, you know, um, it was a paper introducing the concept of alternative beta, which is really um, what we thought should be the, the beta of the hedge fund. And then once we were able to actually figure out what the beta of hedge funds are, we came to the conclusion that a majority of hedge funds out there don't really have alpha to their beta, um, which is good and bad if you find the, the hedge funds that do have the alpha because they're gems to have, but you have to be pretty careful at it. Thanks, Mark. I, I know um, and sophie had a little bit of a, a discussion here around the erosion of alpha, right, and this regime timing component. And then how do you think about that in the concept of executing your strategy? Uh, and certainly others, you know, or Jackie jump in, but I, I think you had an interesting observation on that kind of that concept of the erosion of alpha. Yeah, I think it, it partially overlaps with what Mark has just mentioned. Um, the beta and the alpha is really in the eye of the beholder. Uh, it really depends upon the starting points. When I was a quantitative equity manager, whatever we were defining as alpha would be somebody else's beta. Why? not because of something specific that we did, but because of what we were forced to do in order to generate excessive return, excess returns. And the reason was that we had been given benchmarks that were style-driven. So if you manage something against a benchmark which is growth, value, momentum, and God knows what, and you only have 3%, 4% tracking error, you will not actually go into like the most orthogonal source of return you can go you will go into something which is slightly different. So that something is slightly different for somebody else would be beta. In our case, it would be alpha, okay? What I do see through time though, because I haven't been just an equity manager, I'm more focusing on risk premium and tactical asset allocation, is that there has been a semantic drift over the years. And what used to be um, hedge fund alpha, uh, these days would be just factors that need to be neutralized in order to properly define the alpha, exactly like what Mark was, was mentioning. Something that really hasn't changed though, I mean, depending on how we want to you know, slice the pie, is the uncertainty at the end of the equation, the epsilon. Okay, so how do we split it? Is there more beta? Is there less alpha? Is there more uncertainty? And sometimes the way I tend to think of this is to say, well, if I cannot even define what my alpha is, maybe my game is not really to increase my alpha, but to, to diminish my uncertainty on the epsilon side, you know, to increase the Sharpe ratio. Mm -hmm. That's playing with a denominator. Thank you. Yes, yeah. uh, honestly, that residual at the end of the alpha calculation, back in the day, that was hedge fund alpha. And then with the introduction of risk premia, better understanding around hedge fund betas, less and less of that premium remains in, in the classic definition. Uh, the reality is from our perspective, we think there's still plenty of alpha to be had there, uh, but it is a definition, definitional question. Um, the $4 trillion that are sitting in alternatives right now, 
Um, it is, you know, the industry is at peak assets, but I'd argue that a sizable portion of that capital is actually managed in a alternative beta type format. All the lines are blurred, hedge funds are running mutual funds, mutual funds are running hedge funds type strategies, there's risk premium embedded into everything. So there's still alpha out there, it's just back in the 90s to capture that alpha all you had to do was do convertible arbitrage or do merger arb. Today you really have to look a little harder and that's why Jack and I have uh, you, know, you know, a lot of job security because finding those sources of alpha or managers who can pursue and find those alphas is harder. You need to go into niche markets, you need to go into areas that are less efficient, you need to go into places where automation hasn't yet propagated. Credit trading, for example, is still very much OTC. Distressed, event-driven investing, things that are more qualitatively driven and not as easy to automate. Um, not to mention Bitcoin and uh, you know crypto and lots of other uh, less efficient asset classes. So the question of um, you know where is the hedge fund alpha? When you go back to what happened after the financial crisis and all the QE went into equity markets, uh, we had you know more than a decade now, you know 14, 15 years running up up until the last couple of years, constrained volatility in rates, zero rates, you know, and, and all the money was flown into equity. So you didn't need the argument for alternatives if the only game in town was equities. But unfortunately, as we learned the hard way, you know, the policy of zero rates um, does eventually end badly. Um, it led to the uh, burst of the bond bubble. It led to the severe correction we saw in uh, tech in 2022 when NASDAQ was down 30 odd percent. Uh, it led to the burst of the bubbles in like SPACs and Crypto had a few uh, meaningful booms and busts in the last couple of years. So, you know, the, the world of overly um, so much constrained volatility just gave rise to these like perverse investment behaviors. So as the world now, so, so we learned that, you know, any zero policy doesn't work. Zero emissions, zero COVID, zero rates, especially we already saw. But now as people are more concerned, you know, we just went through this big hiking cycle and what it means implications going forward. People are concerned about long only and all the money and flows that went into passive investments. So really the best protection from this is uh, active management. And um, when you think about, you know, what is the ultimate form of tail protection? Trading, trading oriented strategies. I mean, you, you could waste money on insurance, you know, buying puts on equities. Uh, uh, credit spread wideners. You could do all sorts of things, but really the best defense is a trading-oriented mandate and, um, you know, consider veering away from just a passive, long-only, you know, um, stay and pray, see what happens kind of thing. So I think now, more than ever, uh, people are, uh, you know, interested, concerned, intrigued, looking at uh, searching for alpha opportunities um, in, in hedge funds. So the hedge fund conundrum, you know, it's been, it's challenging, you know, big picture, when you look at the hedge fund indices this year, you know, through the end of Q3, a lot of the indices, the fund of funds composite and things like this are up maybe four, five, six percent tops, you know, and people are just getting a little bit frustrated thinking about, you know, why bother and you can earn five and a quarter, five and a half sometimes in cash and money market, you know, some tax free munis are paying the same thing. So, you know, the challenge is there, but you have to be more forward looking. And that's the. Uh, that's it's it's like you're getting paid to hold an option right yeah. now. It's interesting. A any other reactions uh, on, on the points Art and Jackie raised? Or I mean, the whole point of alternatives as we define them, hedge funds, is that it is the one investment asset class broadly where you at least hypothetically have the option of getting alpha on the short side. Pretty much anything else you do in alternatives, private credit, private equity, real estate, those are all long bias, pro-cyclical, pro-growth strategies. And in years such as 2022, when both bonds and uh, equities sell off, pro-growth doesn't work. Now, we've gone through a bit of a growth resurgence so far this year, but ultimately, if you are concerned about um, catching the downside or benefiting from the downside or at least getting out of the way, whether it's through active trading or through the ability to short, hedge funds are unfortunately the only game in town. Not to say that they always do that, and I know Mark has done a lot of work. I'd love to hear about that. Um, on the fact that there's not as much short alpha in hedge funds and historically they do correlate with the risk on assets. That said, at least the option is there, at least the possibility to short for a CTA, for a long short equity manager, for a volatility strategy, that possibility is at least there. Mark, anything you'd want to add there? Or? 
Um, I mean, look, in terms of one thing that uh, there are many ways of adding alpha. Um, let me start by saying I think one of the best ways to add alpha out there, and this is, should be like blasphemy for a hedge fund manager, is putting together non-correlated yeah. alternative betas. I mean, really, that's your most consistent way of finding alpha if you can do that. Uh, you know, I'll admit we try to do it whenever we can because we think it's a very stable source of alpha. Another way of adding alpha that, um, that has worked for us at least is identifying different regimes in the market. Um, you know, uh, we back in 2004, we built the Conquest Risk Index, um, which told us on a daily and a monthly basis whether we were in what you consider a sort of risk on or we call it risk seeking environment or risk off and risk averse environment. Then we went and looked at probably over 300 individual markets. And sure enough, we found that 85% of the markets we looked at showed a very high statistical bias. So it was performing in a very unique way in different risk environment. Then we took that analysis at one level higher and looked at strategies that traded those markets. And we found that 95% of strategies had a very clear statistical bias in terms of their performance. So once you have that information, it becomes painfully, painfully obvious that having a static risk allocation across risk regimes doesn't make sense. So moving from that to a dynamic risk allocation, ends up, and this can work at the allocator level, at the hedge fund level, at and Sabine, do you have something there you want to add? Or? Yeah, a few things on this. Um, I totally agree with you on the, um, on the question of dynamic risk allocation. That's one area in which we're spending a lot of time. I think that beyond adding alpha, the first quality of having alpha is measuring it above zero, i.e. not deleting value from your portfolio, which is sometimes not a very obvious thing to do. So as, as a CIO, I guess that my job is not so much to parameterize or make the best individual strategy, but it's also to decide when to retire strategies, when to evaluate whether they have run their course, and when uh, the environment is no longer uh, conducive. So one may keep faith for a number of years, but after something has not made money for three, five years, obviously the questions become a bit more acute. A uh, key example, for instance, would be uh, FX Trend, which had been one of the engines of trend portfolios uh, before the great financial crisis. On the basis of liquidity, market efficiency, and the rapidity with which um, trends disappear because all these excess returns get arbitraged away, very difficult to keep this in the portfolio these days. So you can work at the individual strategy level, and you can work also at the portfolio level maybe through two dimensions. The first one is mixing up different types of forecasts, ensemble approach. I think it was mentioned this morning in one of the, uh, of the panels, trying therefore to reduce the uncertainty. And the second uh, approach in which I totally would echo what Mark has mentioned is to say, well, is there some predictability and conditionality here that I can exploit to make my portfolio construction a bit more dynamic? And if so, on which basis? What are the fundamental drivers in the economic environment between this and my portfolio return? It's a very dicey question, They're extremely difficult to uh, disentangle. Thank you. So we're maybe just uh, another framing or threshold question around alpha, because I think this is now, you know, we're retreading this a little bit, right? We're reframing this a bit. So I know, Jackie, in your previous panel, there was a discussion around diversification as a, let's say, component of alpha that hedge funds bring to the table. How do we feel about that? Is that you know, is this, is this enough having these like diverse exposures? Um, you know, I think the traditional notion of alpha, if we go back to the, you know, kind of cottage hedge fund industry 25, 30 years ago, I think might've been a little bit different exploiting inefficiencies, but today there's a lot more market efficiency. So how, how do you feel about this maybe newer definition of alpha? So, you know, diversification is, um, it's a good thing, but there can also be a situation where too much diversification diversifies way returns. Yeah. But one thing that uh, we find intriguing now that we think is an um, interesting opportunity set is to be leaning into strategies that are volatility friendly and have, are positively convex. Because, you know, it just feels that we're no longer in a regime of, of low, you know, equity vol. Um, it, it's come off a bit since this surprise natural uh, retracement rally we saw recently, but still, 
uh, gone are the days of a VIX of 10, you know. Rate vol is also uh, uh, up, and it's going to be up even more as we're transitioning in monetary policy to possibly a different regime over the next year. So there's going to be elevated levels of uh, volatility. So it would make sense to lean into strategies that are vol friendly and to be a bit more cautious in any strategy that, uh, uh, you know, has a, a short vol bias because eventually, you know, uh, mistakes do happen and uh, those could be painful. So I just think um, that a lot of the alpha is going to come in from uh, leaning into positive convex strategies. Any areas there that uh, you, you don't like, right? Are there things there that you sort of say, mm, not, not exactly what I'm looking for? Well, I mean, just uh, uh, in general, I would think, you know, uh, you have, it's going to be a lot of dispersion among strategies, but also you have to pick your spots within equity long short and credit. A lot of uh, hedge fund strategies in general usually have a positive bias. Uh, a lot of, you know, long short managers are either, they have two speeds, they're either long or longer. You know, they usually don't go short. Um, same thing with credit managers, uh, emerging markets. There's always a bias for carry and things like this. So I just have to say, you know, more than ever, people have to be critical about understanding where are the sources of alpha coming from, what are the return drivers, what are the factors driving that. So I just think um, uh, people have to be even more aware uh, before than before. packing the return yeah. one. It's, or maybe sticking with you here, the uh, discussion around diversification, like the new notion of alpha, and then maybe we could pivot into, and we'll go down the line here, just areas where you're hunting for that alpha. I think it'd be good now to maybe talk to the audience a little bit about where we have conviction, where we're looking, um, you know, what are some of the things that, that are getting us excited, particularly as we go into this newer regime? Um, sure. Just to add what Jack was saying, the um, higher rates and volatility in general are favorable for hedge fund strategies. Um, higher rates mean higher dispersion. Uh, greater dispersion of outcomes means that you can make money on both the long and the short side. And uh, there's also elevated tail risks. And again, uh, there are certain strategies where you can benefit from, from that elevated volatility. On the rates uh, side specifically, it's important to know that a lot of hedge fund strategies are actually floating rate uh, as you look through the, uh, through the factors that drive their returns. Merger arbitrage, there's a risk-free component built into that. Uh, long short equity, there's the short rebate that you get, you know, that, that picks up on the, on the short side. So um, we're not oblivious to those risks. Obviously, you know, rates have moved a lot in, in the last year and a half. But looking forward, projecting what uh, kind of the, the stop in rising rates and what that means for hedge fund strategies, there are certainly areas where being long optionality that's built into the strategy is favorable for you. Uh, so areas that we are really excited about, discretionary macro, uh, I think that's a strategy that's done well in recent years and we think it will continue to do well just because there's so much dispersion between, even within countries, but even more so across countries, across central banks, uh, across currency regimes, geopolitical factors and so on. That's certainly an area we like a lot. Risk mitigation strategies, again, long optionality, whether it's explicit or implicit in what they do. Uh, we have a very sizable risk mitigation business uh, that we've built up in recent years. Um, again, just the possibility is there to make money being long options. Not to say that uh, you will, you, you know, certainly a lot of options expire worthless, but fundamentally that is the one area where you at least have the possibility of making some money should there be a dislocation, should volatility pick up. Thanks, Art. Any reactions there? Or we could turn to Anne Sophie and Mark, maybe about your areas where you have focus, where you have sort of conviction, but please. Trying to unpack some of that. I mean, there's a lot of content here. <laughs> yeah. Certainly on top of uh, what has been said, diversification can be somebody's worst friend. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if you have more than 30 stocks in your portfolio, why don't just you buy an ETF? Okay, at the end of the day, you need to pay for concentration and for high conviction. Same thing when it comes as a CIO into the uh, art of constructing a relatively balanced portfolio. How many lines, how many strategies would I want in order to say, well, this is what I'm going to deliver to, um, to investors? So let's say we have 200 strategies and maybe 50 which have passed Occam's razor of various criteria. My bet is that past 15, 17, you're not going to add much. And if we push the logic even further, the more and more line and the more and more diversification you're going to get, you're going to get the risk-free rate. 
someone should pay me to get the risk-free rate and invest in something which has 10 plus or 15 plus volatility. That's the conundrum of diversification. The second thing is that diversification is highly elusive, so I would never measure it you know, over a long period of time because my life is much shorter than that. Okay, and even my investment horizon as an, as an investor and as someone who has to answer client calls would be a lot shorter than that. I would look into tail risk, I would look in asymmetric correlation and how asymmetric risk can shift the correlation away from the so-called usual uh, regime. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, any reactions or you want to build on that point? I could talk about other areas of uh, interest to lean into. Yeah, please, Jack. Yeah. So I think another area that's really interesting is uh, just the whole energy sector in general. Energy um, has woken up the last few months, but pretty much it was you know, lagging on the year. I could give you five reasons right now why I think um, energy markets should rally over the next few months. Um, number one is um, global inventories are pretty low and falling. We're off by over 150 million barrels um, in inventory from the highs of spring. And we're pretty much now approaching the lows in global inventory where we were in early 2022, right before Russia invaded Ukraine. And we saw what happened there. You know, oil markets rallied $25 because that was a part of the world that was very sensitive to um, oil exports. But um, it could happen. I mean, uh, inventories are pretty low. Uh, reason number two is um, the Saudis are really incentivized to keep um, oil production tight since their first production cuts in about a year ago, they've since uh, cut two more times, and it's in their incentive to keep um, revenues up as they're trying to fund things like Vision 2030, and uh, it's unlikely that they're going to uh, uh, loosen uh, this uh, anytime soon, although it's possible. Uh, reason number three, the speculative length now in uh, oil markets across uh, futures and options uh, in crude and other products is pretty low. Uh, so there's plenty of room for um, uh, speculators to participate on the upside if this ever wakes up. Um, oil has been has come off a lot because people were worried about recession fears. Um, there was uh, refinery margins came down because there was just a lot of product created, but still consumer demand is still there, and that's reason number four. Uh, consumer demand is still there. If you look at um, the oil use for global transportation across uh, uh, jet fuel, gasoline, diesel. Uh, it's up. It's a healthy 1.7 million barrels a day. It's up. It's increasing. Uh, satellite mobility data will show, you know, there's demand for that as well. And um, reason number five is the geopolitical risk. I mean, people would have assumed, given uh, the terrible news going on in the Middle East, people would have normally assumed that, that oil markets would go up. But it hasn't because currently the conflict, you know, associated um, what's going on in the, the geography it's not the uh, OPEC plus the major countries. It's not Saudi, Iraq, Iran, uh, Russia currently. But I mean, it can. Um, this is a very volatile uh, conflict. A lot of other regional actors could appear uh, in this. There could be supply disruptions. There could be oil strikes you know, on, um, uh, on certain oil facilities. Uh, the US could you know, put sanctions on Iran. Unfortunately, a lot of that oil uh, finds its way to independent refiners in China, so it's out of the jurisdiction of Western economies to enforce sanctions. But these are all things that could happen. It's a very complicated picture. And if you take away the recession fears that what brought oil down to these levels on this recent pullback, uh, now we saw what happened last week, uh, post-Fed, post-payrolls. Um, uh, uh, bad news is good news, no more hike, risk rally. So it's conceivable, as the narrative goes, that maybe oil markets might be limited on the downside, and if anything, there's a possibility of a right tail. So uh, what it's, it's worth exploring some potential upside within oil, and you could do that a variety of ways. Even with uh, long short managers that trade in the energy sector, there's usually higher alpha on the, uh, easier alpha to get on the long side. And so it, it's just quite possible. So anyway, I'm, I'm very intrigued about it. Uh, Oil equities especially have lagged a lot uh, of oil prices, so that looks particularly cheap. It's a bit of a contrarian view because, you know, recently we saw this pullback. But anyway, we're worthy of uh, looking into Yeah, the energy complex, a lot going on. Any, any views that speakers want to jump on there in the energy complex uh, or, or other areas? I'm not smart enough to predict uh, pricing of any one asset class. There's lots of people who try to do that. Um, it kind of goes counter to what we try to do, which is deliver diversification and exposure to other asset classes. 
I'll just stress the fact that, again, in my mind, alpha, the way to capture alpha is to go into places that are less efficient, that have non-economic buyers and sellers, that have, uh, you know, real structural inefficiencies that make it a difficult place to be crowded. Uh, structured credit, right? For, for years and years, people have paid it on structured credit just because it's complex, it's illiquid, it has tail risks. Uh, commercial real estate. I mean, uh, we, we're, we've all read thousands of headlines about how, how bad that market is. It is a not a homogenous market. It's very local. It's very inefficient. I'm not saying go out and buy a bunch of commercial real estate. All I'm saying is, from an alpha perspective, markets like that, that are unloved, that are misunderstood, that don't, don't have enough people following them, that's, those are the places where, that we're interested in. Insurance linked securities, volatility trading, lots and lots of places like that. Emerging markets, the more esoteric, the better. Um, just because that's where, in my mind, in, in this environment, that's, what, that's where the alpha is. It's not in trying to predict, you know, next quarter's Apple earnings. There's many, many more people looking, uh, looking and trying to predict that than, you know, what happens with uh, South African real estate. So, so maybe just uh, quickly there, like, when you think about implementing in those areas, you know, Jackie mentioned equity long short. Are, are you looking sort of uh, to get into like the credit side of the equation here or where, where do you kind of, you know, taking it a level deeper, kind of look for that real opportunity? Um, side? Maybe we'll go to Mark then we'll talk a little about the quant side as well. Sure. Well, I oversee credit event and relative value, which is a pretty broad uh, mandate. So uh, we have a team of people doing that. Um, I am partial to credit uh, just because the credit expertise and investment uh, knowledge is very valuable. You can literally invest up and down the capital structure. Um, from stress, from performing to stress to distressed, high yield, uh, that level, that sort of analysis and that sort of knowledge is very, very valuable. But in terms of pursuing those opportunities, again, our preference as an allocator to managers is to uh, focus on managers who can do more than one thing. We try not to uh, pigeonhole managers into one area, even though they might have tremendous expertise there. We think there's value to be created from having the flexibility to move across uh, asset classes, as long as it's within your core expertise. So within structured credit, for example, uh, yes, I could buy a commercial, you know, CMBS only manager or an RMBS only manager. My preference is to invest in somebody who can move across those two markets and pursue the opportunities when, uh, when they're there and then get out when they're not. Uh, somebody who's much closer to those markets than we are, we are obviously a couple of steps in removed. Uh, so th that's our approach, and in general, it's served us uh, well over the years, so we're sticking to it. Thanks, Art. Uh, maybe, Mark, we'll shift to you just on the quant side, thinking about, you know, where those real opportunities are, where you're focusing your efforts, your team's efforts in terms of research. Sure. Um, I mean, look, for, I think, at least for our world of quant, uh, we find always a lot more opportunities when volatility is higher. Um, and when I look at the current vol environment, I don't think it reflects the reality of the macro picture that we're looking at now. Um, so it's I'm actually- understating it. Yes, it's very much so. Um, I think we started something in 2022, then we took a one year break from it. So the period from, incidentally enough, um, our own risk index went risk seeking in October of last year, and it remains risk seeking until now. But when I look at the granular level data, uh, we're, I'm seeing a lot of conversions now where from these levels, it wouldn't take much to sort of flip it. But one year of risk-seeking behavior is fairly long, you know, in one cycle that we've seen. Now, there are certain factors that I think have caused this to happen. I think one of them was the fact that, um, you know, uh, when you look at the U.S. consumer coming out of the whole uh, COVID sort of giveaway period, uh, was about $4.3 trillion richer. So that extra cushion allowed the U.S. consumer to really you know, withstand the first few rounds of asset hike, of uh, price hikes. Uh, well, I think we're down to about $19 billion in that, um, in that excess. You, know. uh, you look at another factor, which is you know, the, the debt ceiling debate in the first six months of this year that caused an impromptu $600, $700 billion QE when we're supposed to be in a QT. Um, so once these sort of extraneous factors go away, I think uh, markets will revert sort of to, to continuing the job that started in, in 2022. And I think one of the most interesting things that I've seen begun in 2022 is really what's happening to long-dated rates. 
Um, I think long dated rates have been in one super cycle from the early 80s when Volcker uh, pretty much vanquished that inflation run. Um, I think, you know, and, and I'll preface say this, our strategy is quantitative. So whatever my views are have nothing to do on what we do. But my own personal feeling is that, is that 2022 marked the end of that 40 year super cycle we've seen of lower interest rates. And we're embarked on sort of the next super cycle of higher interest rates. And, you know, the reasons for that are demographics, uh, the size of our debt, uh, the general leverage factor. So I think that, uh, I mean, look, I think that the fact of the matter is, I think we had such a responsible monetary and fiscal policy for 14, 15 years from 09 to 2022 that built so many imbalances into the system uh, that it's going to take us years and years to work from under. And I think we started that in 02. We took a one-year break, but we're ready to sort of continue that. Yeah, you're hearing bubbles popping, right? Like kind of like left and right. Well, I mean, I'll give you one simple example. I always like in a lot of my investor meeting. You know, I try to explain why markets go up and down, and, and I always talk that, you know, at the any advanced state of a business cycle, uh, money starts getting misallocated. When money starts getting misallocated. Um, Markets correct to reorient that money to where it best utilized. You get to a certain price where it is value. You people come in. You start the next healthy bull trend. But I always found it very difficult to explain what it means to money being misallocated. Well, I mean, um, you know, after watching a few of these NFTs selling at Christie's and Sotheby's for 85, 90 million dollars, I have one example there. Another example in watches where. You know, Patek Philippe last year was asking buyers to write an essay of why they should be allowed to buy a 300,000 Patek Philippe watch. And you know what? That gives me a lot, big confidence that we have a lot of volatility coming. Yeah. And still a lot of excess capital. And a lot of excess capital. And Safid, anything you want to add or anyone want to jump in? Yeah, where we're spending a lot of time at the moment will be uh, lines of research, which are very parallel to what Mal uh, Mark has mentioned i.e. regime switching, and I know there was a talk this morning addressing regime switching, there's different definitions for that. Uh, I don't quite believe in regime switching in a very technical sense of the word. Why? Because I've got my teeth kicked in for the last 20 years trying to harness the power of all these beautiful econometric models and trying to estimate these things just on the virtue of price and returns alone is, politely said, fraught with difficulty. Uh, where, where I believe there is certainly a bit more potential is to try to capture the broad strokes of what is driving some of the key categories or the key things in the portfolio. You know, why should carry profitable? What are the environments where trends can make money? In which environments do I think that market imbalance, okay, which benefits from the asymmetric positioning of market participants, is likely to continue to last and therefore I should continue to invest in them? So, and, and because I'm, I don't have a discretionary bone in my body, then the, what I try to do is, rather than focus on the root causes of things which are likely to change every time there is an upset in the market, I will try to focus on some of the key business cycle drivers of that. Uh, so we're doing a lot of research on growth and inflation, which also have the added benefit of, I think, being the key driver of the stock bond correlation. So there's also a bit extra for everyone to be got in the game, not just the alpha, but also why uh, traditional asset allocation may suffer in years to come from this added volatility on the inflation front. Additional lines of research may include, you know, is valuation important, even for long short strategies? on the cross-asset risk premium side. And I know that that's a topic that's not very popular, and precisely because it's not popular, I would like to research it more. Yeah, if you think back to like, you know, 2008, 2009 period, you know, that if you just figured like, hey, money was me free for the next 14 years, you did great, right? And that regime was just so persistent, but the mindset then had that recency bias of like how difficult 2008 was. Or did you have something you wanted uh, to say? No, just on valuations, the fact that if you look at S&P performance over pretty much any year, 90% of that is driven by the changes in the multiple, which really have nothing to do with valuations and uh, nothing to do with earnings and everything to do with the market's perception of value, right? So behavioral aspects, psychological aspects, and then the macro factors are unfortunately dominating. Yeah. So we've got about a minute left. and. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a speed round here. So we'll go down maybe 
in 15, 20 seconds uh, just to knock these out. So number one, um, what's the wall of worry? What's keeping you up at night? What's going to go wrong? Uh, really quick, uh, three things, uh, massive uh, deficits, massive debt, uh, what it means, the implications of rates higher for longer. We saw how what happened in March with March Madness taking out four or five banks. There was a very quick and swift policy response, but uh, another problem could happen again. Uh, number two, AI adoption and the love for AI uh, might not all be happening at the same time. This is a long-term thing, like climate change. Uh, it's not all going to work right now. There's going to be periods of uh, cycles with AI adoption. We're okay for now, but who knows if, you know, when earnings miss and investors are going to be quick uh, to exit. Uh, number three, geopolitical. Uh, this uh, crisis and conflict is a bit more complicated than what we've seen in the past. Plus a big election cycle. Yeah. An election cycle, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's politics in the U.S., everything from income inequality to the election cycle. Just because the U.S. is the trendsetter for a lot of the world, it, uh, you know, what happens in politics here has real-life implications for geopolitics, right? How many carrier groups can we send into the, into the Middle East? Uh, how, how well can we support Ukraine? Uh, and, uh, you know, Im impact on taxes, impact on uh, environmental policy. Uh, you know, every election matters. We have our local elections coming up tomorrow. Hopefully everybody votes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that, that definitely, in the very short term, that keeps me up at night more so than anything else. And Sophie? Two things, misestimation of risk, uh, and therefore something that could massively impact uh, my positions and the size that we thought was appropriate. And the second one would be baked-in bias in whatever underlying logic myself or my colleagues baked in certain strategies, including the secular decrease in interest rates uh, or the resurgence of new narratives, to which extent has this uh, influenced or polluted my way of thinking, such that I'm baking an extra ingredient in my strategies today I'm not even aware of. Mark, bring us home. Look, I think um, inflation is going to be a lot stickier than people think it is. I think it's going to be with us for a while. I see rates still go, I mean, higher for longer or, you know, even higher than they are now. Um, and, you know, we live in a world where we can't really discount that um, exogenous effect that can come from, uh, you know, these um, the political risk, uh, you know. Uh, so that can happen any day. Um, but uh, I think we have plenty of endogenous events that are causing enough risk. Uh, that uh, to worry about aside from the exogenous ones. It's a lot to keep us up at night. Well, thank you, everyone. Really appreciate uh, the conversation here. Thanks, everyone, for listening in. Please give a warm round of applause to the panelists. <laughs>